I can never resist the chance to preach on the David and Bathsheba story, but um, that was not, uh, I'm not going to do that today. So if you have questions about David and Bathsheba or you're really, really dying to know more about it, uh, let's get coffee this week and we can, I'll be happy to talk your ear off about David and Bathsheba. But I want to talk about our gospel reading and the feeding of the 5,000, uh, primarily because there is a, a process Jesus leads the disciples through in this situation that I, I feel applies to us in our life when we're faced with seemingly impossible scenarios. Now, you and I both know nothing is impossible to God. With God, all things are possible. But, but to us, we might, be, we might be facing scenarios that seem impossible, that we can't see a way through them or see a solution. And uh, the feeding of the 5,000 is one of those. And, and I believe Jesus walks his disciples through three steps in, the, in that story that he walks all of us through when we face some of those seemingly impossible situations. Now, the timing may be different. The sequencing or how, how long each sequence lasts might be different. But I believe the steps are the same for, for us today as they were then. And so I want to tell you what they are. The first step in the story is that Jesus makes them or allows them to feel the weight of the scenario, the weight of the challenge, uh, the weight of the situation. Here's what I mean. Jesus has an idea in his head what he's going to do before he starts the conversation. It tells us in the scripture, Jesus knows what he's going to do, but he doesn't tell them he knows what he's going to do. Now, you might think that's a little unfair, but it's how he works, right? We don't get to tell him how to work. It's how he works. So he, instead of saying, hey, guys, there's a lot of hungry people coming. We've got to feed them, but I've got a plan. He doesn't do that. Just like in your life or in my life, he doesn't say, hey, there's this really hard family problem you're dealing with. I've got a plan. Don't worry about it. Or, hey, there's this really big financial hurdle or challenge you're going to have to face. I've got a plan. Don't worry about it. Or, hey, there's this new situation in your life that's going to be stressful for a while. I've got a plan. Don't worry about it. He didn't do that. He didn't do that for the disciples. Instead, he lets them and allows them and, and I think really wants them to feel the weight of it. So he looks at Philip and he says, how, how are we going to feed all these people? Like, there's a problem here, guys. Does anybody know that there's a problem? Now, Jesus knows the problem, and he knows how to fix it, and he knows how he's going to fix it, but doesn't share any of that. He just looks at Philip and says, how are we going to feed these people? And Philip starts to have a moment, right? He's, he's doing the math in his head. Maybe Philip was like, you know, had some good accounting skills, right? He's, he's doing like a per head cost of a meal or, or something like that. He's figuring out, he goes, see, because he comes up with a random number, six months wages, Right? If six months wages wouldn't feed all these people. Now, I don't know, that, that number is different for every single person in this room. So we don't need to kind of adjust that for inflation. You just think about that in your own terms. When it, Philip looks at that crowd and he says, man, six months wages wouldn't buy, wouldn't pay for this meal for 5,000 people. Think about what a wedding would cost with 5,000 people at it. Those of you that have had kids get married. Right, or those of you that have paid for weddings. Think about what a wedding price tag would be if you had 5,000 people at it. Right, Philip's probably running that math in his head. Like, what's the, what, what was the bar mitzvah fee we had to pay like, per person? What was it? You know, there's, there's, they're just doing math. Six, six months' wages wouldn't cover a meal for these people. How are we going to do this? And notice Jesus still doesn't give the answer. He doesn't say, no, 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 don't worry. I got it. He just kind of lets it sit there. And when you and I are facing a struggle, we might be facing a family struggle, we might be facing a personal struggle, a health struggle, all, you know, all the above. Right? Jesus might not give us the answer right away. He might not say, oh, no, 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 I got it. He might let us sit there for a minute and feel the weight of it. This is a situation that I can't figure out. That's, that's the place he wants us to get to, to say, this is a situation I can't on my own figure out. I need help. So 
uh, Philip is is kind of probably trying to do some other math in his head, thinking about what what way they could feed the people. And Andrew uh, brings up another point. He says, um, "Here's here's a boy. It's interesting. It's a kid." Now I think you know an adult. I'm, I, I don't want to. I don't want to um, paint myself in a bad light. But I think an adult would be a little more selfish with the food, because you'd be you'd be you'd be running scenarios in your head. Okay, what if we're out here two more days? I've got one loaf of bread. Um, I can't give this up because my wife might need it, my family might need it. But you can see the innocence of a kid that's like, "Hey, Jesus, I got five loaves of bread. You can have it." Not thinking about the next meal or saving it, or if that those were for all his brothers and sisters. There's like just an innocence to a kid that's saying like. Hey, Jesus is looking for food. Okay, give him ours. That's fine. When you can maybe put yourself in the position of somebody who might have had a little bit and said, sorry, Jesus, I don't have any to spare. This has got to get my family through dinner, if I had any. So there's a kid with five loaves and two fish, assuming he has it for his family, or maybe his parents sent him with enough food for his siblings, but he offers it up to Jesus. But Andrew says, uh, again, kind of feeling the weight of the situation, what is that going to do? There's so many people here. How is this going to help, right? If Andrew saw one family with teenagers in there, he knew that that loaves and fish would not make it to the second family. He knew, he, he knew, people eat. Like, this isn't going to, this isn't going to make it. This isn't going to last. And that's not what Jesus is, uh, that's not why Jesus is asking, you know, like this, this is enough food to, to feed everyone, but um, he takes it. And so the second thing, the first, the first part is Jesus allows us to feel the weight of the situation. Even if he knows what he's going to do and he knows how it's going to end, he allows us to feel the weight of the situation. So we realize we've come to like the end of our capacity, that we're beyond ourselves. And then the second thing is he uh, looks for the little bit we might have to offer to the situation. Whatever it is. Now think about the need. 5,000 people, hungry, ready to eat. We have five loaves of bread and two fish. Andrew's right. What's that going to do? And maybe there are times when you and I are stuck in a situation where, again, a family rift or, or a challenge that we think, I can do this little gesture. What's that going to do? How's that going to make a difference? Maybe we just even think about kind of the, the, the state of the world today and, and all that, the anger and the, the division that's in it. And we think, what is my gesture to one person going to make a difference? What is, my, what is my act of kindness to one person going to make a difference with all that's going on? How does that make a difference? But Jesus is looking for that little bit from us to offer to the situation, whatever it is, the little bit we can do. And this boy brings five loaves and two fishes. There's 5,000 people. It can't, it can't feed everyone. But Jesus isn't asking for that. He's, he's just saying, oh, okay, give me, give me the loaves and the fish. And he takes that little bit, and he blesses it. And then he does the third thing. Now, this particular gospel doesn't get into the dynamics of this third thing as much. The other gospels that tell the story do. He gives the disciples the orders to go out and feed the people before they see the food. This is maybe the hardest part. Because you and I both know people don't like to look stupid. But we also don't like to disappoint people that we love and care about. So you can imagine the disciples here. On the one hand, Jesus told them to do something. We don't want to disappoint him. And on the other hand, if we go out with this basket of food and there's one peat slice of bread in it and I'm supposed to feed a hundred people with that, I'm going to look like an idiot. And so there's a struggle there of, of getting the orders before they see the results. But this is the third thing Jesus asked. The first is, he, he's not going to give us the solution right away. He wants us to feel the weight of the situation so we realize we've come to the end of what we on our own strength and own power can do. That we need his help. He wants us to bring the little bit we have, the little, the, the little bit we can bring to the situation to it. 
And then he wants us to walk out in faith, trusting he solved it before we see it solved. That might be the hardest part. And so the disciples go and they carry these baskets, whether they're whatever they have in them, um, and they go out, and then the food multiplies. And then they see the solution. Um, the challenge of doing those three things is what Jesus puts in front of us whenever we're facing kind of a seemingly impossible situation. To feel the weight of it, um, to co come to the realization we're at the end of our capacity, to bring our little bit to him, whatever that little bit is, and then to walk in faith, trusting that he will solve it before we see the solution. And that's the process he, le he leads the disciples through on this, to help them grow in their faith, their trust in him. Um, and he does that same process with each of us in different ways in our life. You know, we were in New Orleans this past week uh, on the mission trip, and it was a fun week. Uh, lots of stories to tell for another day. Uh, we won't bore you with them now, but, but soon uh, I will bore you with them. Uh, but one I want to share is I got to reconnect with an old friend. Uh, his name's Jay. He's a deacon in the Episcopal Church there. And Jay uh, was a contractor. He built homes. He built beautiful homes uh, right on... Uh, all, all through New Orleans, and he built one for himself on 12-foot pillars on the shores of Lake Pontchartrain. His backyard is Lake Pontchartrain. And uh, he had built, uh, as a home builder, he wanted to have a nice home for himself, so he had built an 8,400-square-foot home. So you can kind of, right? You can kind of picture the size of that on 12-foot pillars on the shores of Lake Pontchartrain. Uh, and he was ready to pay it off about, he had about six months left to go, uh, and then Hurricane Katrina came to New Orleans. Now, as he tells the story, uh, you know, he was a proud guy and, and kind of had this mindset in his, in his head that the captain goes down with the ship. So he was going to protect his home because he built it for his family. It was his pride and joy, and he was going to stay. And, and somehow, through the use of the force, keep the storm from affecting his house when it was coming on the shores of Lake Pontchartrain. But he did not want to do that to his wife and daughter. He didn't want them to get hurt, so he made arrangements for his wife and daughter to go about two hours inland. And so he loaded up the car for them and said, you guys go, I'm going to stay and protect the house. Because again, uh, sometimes guys don't do the smartest thing. It's just, what can I say? Um, and so uh, his wife and daughter came back in and sat down on the couch and he said, what are you doing? He said, we're in this together. So if you're staying here, we're staying with you. Or we all leave together. It's your choice. And so he was faced with this thing, with his own, as he would say, his own stupidity um, was right in front of him. He did not want his daughter and his wife sitting in this house during the storm. And then he realized, well, how stupid is it that I'm going to sit in this house during the storm? So for them to leave, he got in the car. And they went, all went to the place that he had set up for them. Four days later, when he came back, um, there was nothing there but a foundation. Everything, every, everything in that house was at the bottom of Lake Pontchartrain. Uh, he had said the, the waves were full of, the storm surge was full of wood and pieces of boats and all kinds of materials from other buildings and hit the house like a wall of concrete, tore it apart, sunk it to the bottom of the lake. He would be dead if he would have stayed. Uh, he drove back four days later and everything he had kind of labored for, he would tell you his life was about getting the stuff, achieving success, kind of having the nice house, the nice car, and making it. Um, and he was always the guy that said, yeah, I'll do that stuff for other people later, right? I'll, I'll be more involved in the church later. I'll be more involved in my community later. When I, after I've made my money and I have enough to be comfortable, then I'll give back. And he would say when he was standing there looking at the foundation, he realized uh, it was time for a change. He felt the weight of kind of an impossible situation on him. And he realized he was at the end of his capacity. So he turned to God. And uh, he would tell the story. I'm not going to tell his whole story. Uh, one day I hope to have him here that he could tell you his story, but that it changed his life. And he says, uh, he, he, in his words, he says, I'm like Job, where God gave me back seven times what I had before, but better. 
because his heart was open now. And he uh, became a deacon and he served people with alcoholism in New Orleans for so many years because he had a hopeless story and he can speak to people who are out of hope. And he's ministered to people in AIDS, uh, dealing with AIDS and in all kinds of various sorts of, of, of just at the end of their hope uh, because he found himself in that place and he found a calling that day. He found his faith that day. And he would tell you that day that he faced the impossible situation was the day that God began um, to grow the mustard seed of faith in him. Uh, I hope no one in this room has to go through that. It's not what I'm saying, that, that we're, we're going to face something like that. But those moments where we face the things that might be too heavy for us to carry, the, the things that feel impossible are the moments where God is, is putting us at the limits of what we can handle, asking us to trust him and wanting to grow our faith in him. He will uh, let you feel the weight of that situation, just like he did with the disciples. He will ask you to bring your little bit to it. And then he's going to ask us to walk in faith, trusting him to solve the problem, even before we see the solution. And he does that because he wants our faith and trust to grow. And so maybe you're in one of those spots today. Maybe you are here wrestling with the weight of a seemingly impossible situation. It might be personal, professional, financial, whatever it is. Or maybe you're um, just trying to bring your little bit to a something that feels a need that feels so great it's beyond your capacity to, to make a dent. Or, or maybe you're in that third place where you're trusting him to come through for you and hear your prayer, but you're not seeing it yet. And wherever, wherever you might be in, the, in those steps, I hope you can maybe register this story uh, as, as hope. It's the process he leads people on to grow in their faith. It's the same God who made the 5,000, uh, fed, fed the 5,000 with five loaves and two fish is, is your God is hearing your prayers, is there with you in your impossible moment. Uh, it's the same God uh, who's willing to provide the, the answer if we trust him. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.